On behalf of the host agencies of the Singapore Summit, I'd like to welcome all our returning as well as first-time participants to this, the seventh edition of the Singapore Summit, which is a gathering of business and thought leaders from Asia and around the world. It's good to see many familiar faces. Uh, those of you who were at the dinner last night would have heard Minister Ong saying that I'm in the second year of a five-year sentence, which if I have good behavior, there might be a remission and an early parole next year. Uh, less fortunate, no doubt, due to his bad behavior, the founding chairman of Singapore Summit, Mr. Giorgio, had to serve his full five-year sentence. Uh, his sacrifice, no doubt, was Singapore Summit's gain, and I'm glad to welcome him back this year as a participant in today's plenary session. So, how shall we assess the past year? and perhaps set the scene somehow for the rest of today's discussions. I suppose first, the good news. The global economy remains relatively robust, with the US stock market surpassing its historical peak. The not so good news is that other capital markets are virtually tanking and a decade long period of low interest rates is coming to an end. The somewhat bad news is that the gathering storm clouds of a spreading trade war, increasing Chinese assertiveness, and the rapidly declining prestige of the United States globally are darkening the geopolitical sky. And what seemed to be possibly a short-term aberration when we met last year, now might well be the start of an epochal change in civilizational relationships. But whereas the horizon was still quite cloudy last year, Today, perhaps we can discern two somewhat more distinct trends, each of them equally worrying. One is the accelerating but hopefully not yet terminal decline of democratic liberalism as the dominant ideology of the post-war global order. And the second is a transition, at least perhaps in the Asian region, from a Pax Americana to a Pax Sinica. And the interaction of these two trends, like tectonic plates grinding inexorably against each other, will determine whether there will be a peaceful or cataclysmic geopolitical change for the rest of this century. To begin with, liberal democracy and its major outcome, the globalization of the movement of both capital and labor, is facing probably its most serious existential threat since the end of the Cold War a half century ago. The angry dissonance which spewed out from the excesses of financial capitalism and the inequalities of globalization has not faded. Indeed, it has found stronger organizational vigor and connectivity with far-right populist movements and governments even in Austria, Spain, Italy, Hungary, the list goes on. And almost unimaginable a year ago, the staunchly centrist or social democratic governments of Germany or Sweden are besieged by far-right political parties. And ironically, the continued unraveling of liberal democracy in the past year has shown that the most serious challenge is indeed not even external from either ultra-nationalistic populism in the West or dynamic authoritarian state capitalism from China. It is, in fact, from within. The failure of intellectually and morally exhausted liberal democracies to offer a compelling, practical, and sustainable alternative to far-right populism. A decade after the global financial crisis, cynicism is continuing to grow about the determination or indeed even the ability of global elites to reform a system which exacerbates inequalities. Disparities, in the rate of wealth creation and income differentials continue to significantly favor the top 1% who own more than half of global wealth and whose incomes are growing at double the rate of the bottom half of mankind. All of us who attend these conferences hear these numbers over and over again and we lament that nothing is being done and inequalities are growing and far-right populism is growing but we are somewhat like deer looking at headlights and immobilized. So Pax Americana, or the global post-war order, 
and liberal democracy are at a frail and dangerous crossroad. Will they somehow find the will to reinvent themselves or instead become relics of the past with today's leaders in liberal democracies complicit and complacent in their own demise? These issues will be discussed in our first session entitled The Shifting Business Landscape, Overcoming Disruptions in the Globalized World. The second session, Navigating Geopolitical Risks and Challenges in the Asia-Pacific Region, tightens the focus specifically to the Asia-Pacific area, or what the Americans now like to call the Indo-Pacific Region. And I think the single most important trend here is a slow but relentless emergence of what I would call Pax Seneca, for lack of a better term. Now, most Western views of China have been conditioned by the 20th century world order, which views the world through the lens of a largely American perspective. But what is good for the USA is good for the rest of the so-called free world. In large part, America has legitimately and deservedly won this trust. Not only did it lead the Allies in winning World War II, but in the creation of the subsequent Pax Americana, a polite euphemism for hegemony, the US guaranteed by political and military might the sovereignty, the security, and the stability of countries willing to subscribe to a Pax Americana. This lasted for some 70 years, but possibly may not persist into the next century. And not only because America's global leadership is being seriously eroded from within by its own president and others, but also because current Chinese policy has taken a more overtly nationalistic turn. For the past few decades, when its ascendancy was still uncertain, China was content to tone down its assertiveness. Chinese leaders like Deng Xiaoping preached more coexistence and cooperation than confrontation and competition. No more. And just as the word crisis in Chinese, wei ji, combines the term for danger as well as opportunity, China's new view today is that the current crisis in US-China relationships is in fact the time to claim and for the world to acknowledge China's long thwarted civilizational ambitions. A Pax Seneca will be underpinned by economic and military power, but led also by a sustainable and singular vision of its destiny. Made in China 2025 is an extremely ambitious, audacious, and yet ultimately still realistic roadmap for China to attain global rank or even supremacy in 10 high-tech critical fields of human endeavor, including artificial intelligence and climate change technologies. Even conservative estimates predict that within 20 years, the overall Chinese economy will be one-third larger than that of the US economy. But because on a per capita basis, it will still be less than that of half of that of America's, there still remains a tremendous amount of room to grow before China's economy reaches a developed world slowdown. In 1998, Chinese military spending already overtook that of Russia. Today, it is double that of Russia and two-thirds that of the United States. Reaching military rather than economic parity will take longer than 20 years, but it's almost taken for granted as something that will happen by both Chinese and Western scenario planners. Now, to advocates of the current world order where the US is the ultimate global peacemaker and policeman, Pax Sinica may sound sinister, and at best, a hidden form of Chinese imperialism. To the Chinese, however, and every person in China has a very keen sense of history, Pax Sinica is a legitimate reversion to its centuries-old, historically validated role. After all, as they maintain in China, there have been previous Pax Sinicas during the period of Han China about 2,000 years ago, or Tang China about 1,000 years ago. And the Chinese think 
in that kind of time frame. And these were, in fact, the golden eras of Chinese history, when China was an open, cosmopolitan, and enlightened civilization, exercising more soft than hard power to become the dominant player in Asia. The point here is that a newly nationalistic and assertive China wants and needs to make to the world, and particularly its neighbors here in Asia, a nuanced set of signals. On one hand, Pax Seneca, even from centuries ago, did not have territorial conquest as one of its aspirations. Chinese historians and policymakers frequently allude to the difference between the Chinese concepts of a China-centric Zhongguo, that kind of hegemony, and they contrast that to the Western notions of territorially expansive empires. And in the Chinese view, the Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI, is a foundational component of Pax Seneca and has, in fact, its original origins in the China of Marco Polo, where building connectivity was more important than seizing territory. On the other hand, while it eschews territorial conquest, China clearly wants to be recognized as the primary power player in Asia, the first among equals, at least. And after all, from their point of view, just as American interests have always dictated that the Western Hemisphere is within the USA's sphere of influence, then by the same token, a Pax Seneca would not allow the USA to claim the role of policemen in China's backyard, the South China Sea. And as an example, China recently signed an agreement with ASEAN to establish a code of conduct for the South China Seas, but clearly without US involvement. Now, opponents of a Pax Seneca point out that American predominance in East Asia is at the overt and the official invitation of Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, and other countries. China, if it is to succeed in its civilization ambition of establishing a Pax Seneca, will have to convince detractors that its emergence from its own convulsive internal chaos of the Cultural Revolution only a few decades ago will not relapse, and that its status as a global superpower is deserving of the trust and respect of the world. China's record as a responsible player in climate change, financial services, or regional infrastructural investment is growing rapidly. But in other areas, it still has to convince skeptics that a Pax Seneca would be at least as benign as that of a Pax Americana. China will also have to contend with deep-rooted wariness from Japan and China and Vietnam and assure the world community that the one-China policy vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan will not be resolved except but peacefully. These assurances will have to be proven not by just words, but also action in coming years. But whether the world likes it or not, whether it will be total or partial, some kind of Pax Seneca is clearly in the offing. A civilization as old, as continuous, and as resurgent as China has a sense of its own destiny, which is more than just to be yet another Asian country under American security umbrella. And it clearly has a vision of its destiny, which is not what the West may have in mind. For ASEAN, we will have to navigate within this vaguely, still vaguely conceived, much less well-executed Pax Seneca with considerable skill, subtlety, and knowledge of the importance of nuanced signaling and actions. As China's smaller neighbor for thousands of years, ASEAN has to recognize the reality of being within China's sphere of influence, but without ever surrendering our individual sovereignties or subordinating our own vital national interest. And so, speaking truth to power, maintaining a constructive neutrality, and adopting policies which are in both ASEAN's and China's core interests are some principles which ASEAN countries should uphold even as a Pax Seneca emerges over the next century. The third session 
Southeast Asia, rise of the digital economy and a single consumer market looks at ASEAN from a much brighter perspective, thankfully. With a combined GDP of 2.6 trillion US dollars, ASEAN will become the world's fourth largest market by 2030. Its middle class is fast approaching 400 million people spending over 200 billion US dollars a year just in the internet economy. What specific opportunities can we identify? Is there a single dominant ASEAN consumer profile emerging? How will the digital economy allow ASEAN to leapfrog phases of development? Our panelists will tackle these questions. The fourth and the final session is titled Big Tech and the Well-Being of Consumers, Businesses, and Society. It rounds off our geographically oriented sessions by pulling back and looking at things from a more global perspective. With the recent scandals enveloping the monopolistic as well as privacy-threatening behavior by a handful of global internet-based firms, Big Tech is now pilloried as the handmaidens of a 1984-style dystopia. Now, what possible alternatives are viable? What is the balance between regulation and an unfettered big tech dominance of global information? What innovative new platforms may in fact be on the horizon? All these issues will be discussed by our distinguished panelists, and we welcome, of course, your own active participation. And finally, another set of active participants at Singapore Summit this year are the young societal leaders, 22 young leaders from 11 countries representing a diverse range of interests who are seated amongst all of you. Last year, their participation not only considerably lowered the average age of our attendees, thankfully, but it also deepened and it broadened the summit's intergenerational engagement. And two of the young leaders will speak at the luncheon plenary session on corporate social responsibility. We're also honored to have Datuk Seri Anwar Ibrahim, leader of the ruling party in Malaysia and its prime minister in waiting for a very long time. He will speak to us at the S. Rajaratnam Endowment Dialogue before the close of the conference. I hope all of you will participate actively in the discussions today and in the process, I hope that we can also learn from each other. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.